Welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Bud Elliott. That's Danny Cannell. That's Tom Fernelli. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook network. Thank you for hanging out. And if you are watching us live, do me a favor. Smash that like. Smash that subscribe. Come and join us in the live chat. We love getting your reaction as we run through these win totals. And that is on the agenda for today. We tackle the SEC East today. We will do the SEC West on Wednesday. Also, before we get out of here, the coaches poll was released just or is being released right now. Uh, we'll get a, a quick rundown of that. And also, uh, very, very um, interesting, surprising, confusing news out of Norman, Oklahoma, as we get an 11 p.m. Sunday night resignation from Oklahoma assistant Kale Gundy. Uh, we'll get into that and more. But I, I, I didn't want to have all these fans that are coming here for these SEC East win totals as we finally have arrived with the Georgia Bulldogs a team that was once this was a Georgia pot once it, it, it has not been, but we will see, but, but, but we can't jump right into Georgia. Uh, let's go ahead and get things going with the general manager of Vanderbilt football. As much as I think it's the, the under Count is a up. safe play. Like I can't even. Count them up. Count them up. How many kids are going to win this fall? I can't fathom who wins. How many kids are going to win this fall? I just can't. I don't see it. It's not, it's not on there. It's not, not the schedule I'm looking at. Unless there's another schedule somewhere. That's right. And as Carson is celebrating in the chat, the whole crew is here. What else would you expect? We are getting closer to kickoff. Uh, we are all dialed in. We begin a rundown of the SEC East with the Georgia Bulldogs over under win total at the Caesar Sportsbook of a round 11 wins. If you want to take the over, priced at minus 130. If you want to take the under at plus 100. You take a look at the non-conference schedule. There is that opening game against Oregon. The schedule will say it's neutral. Ah, we know better than that. That's in the big body bins in Atlanta. Uh, that should be a very, uh, very pro Georgia crowd in a building where they have become very comfortable. Samford also uh, on the non-con Kent state and then good old fashioned hate against Georgia tech at the end of the season. That game will be in Athens, the, the game against Auburn that it comes every single year, that game in Athens, the sec West rotator is going to be at Mississippi state coming in kind of an interesting spot in the schedule, uh, right around a road game at Kentucky, the other road games in division play at South Carolina early on at Missouri midway through the season, Home games in division play, Vanderbilt, Florida, and Tennessee are all coming to Athens. They are the reigning national champions. Uh, they lost, was it five first-round draft picks on the defensive side of the ball? Maybe more? Like 50. I, I think, uh, yeah, it was roughly 50 defensive uh, NFL draft picks from last year's championship team, and yet we're still looking at this like, oh, well, Jalen Carter is going to be a superstar. Nolan Smith's going to be a superstar. Keely Ringo is going to be a superstar. Like you could very quickly see another four or five players getting drafted next year as well. Offensively, Stetson Bennett is back. Uh, this is a group that has probably, for my money, the best or one of the best tight ends in the country in Brock Bowers and a little bit more tight end depth with uh, Darnell Washington and the return of Eric Gilbert. So as we're looking at Georgia, a tough uh, opener against Oregon, and again, a, a couple tricky spots. What are our predictions for Kirby Smart and the Bulldogs with this over-under set at 11? Well, you mentioned earlier that you, you questioned if we're still a Georgia pod. Mm -hmm. uh, it is for me. And I think that we haven't nearly taken as much credit as we should for winning a national title for Georgia. Right. Because You're right. How many national titles did Georgia win before we were a Georgia pod? like none in like a billion years. We become one, bam, national champions. And we were on the way up too. Mm -hmm. We got into the Georgia pod with the hire of Todd Munkin. Whether or not our reasons for becoming a Georgia pod have been fully realized, it's absolutely <laughs> up for debate. But you make a great point, Tom. We we are a part of the national championship rise for the Bulldogs. Yeah, and as a member of what is still a Georgia pod, except for Bud, who clearly hates Stetson Bennett and always will, I'm going, I, I, I'm going over. I think it's push more likely than not, 
because it's hard to go undefeated. But when I look at this schedule and I look at Georgia, I understand like they did lose a lot on defense, but the way that they've recruited in recent years, I really have no reason to believe that that defense might not be historic in 2022 like it was last year, but it's still going to be one of the best ones in the country. And I look at the schedule and it's like, all right, I can see them tripping up somewhere, but I don't see them tripping up twice. So for me, I feel like 11 and one is the floor. 12 and 0 is also within the realm of possibility. And spoiler alert for like next, you know, Wednesday's episode when we get to the West, I wouldn't be shocked if we get an SEC championship game between an undefeated Georgia and an undefeated Alabama. I'll bet you on that. You want to bet on that? Well, what kind of odds do I get? Bud, set the odds. Set the all right. Give me a second here. Uh, I'll, I'll actually, I know this Georgia stuff by heart, so I don't have to look. I'll, I'll set the odds while I talk. I'm going over <laughs> on this, right? And one of the reasons why I'm going over on this is because uh, I don't like betting these super high numbers if losing a quarterback might hurt. And as somebody who had the 10 to 1 ticket last year on Georgia, uh, I really, really love how Stetson Bennett got at home. I don't actually think he's all that special. Can't totally rule out the idea that he might get better. Uh, I do think the offense will improve from last year. I really like their offensive line and some of their offensive line depth. I think they have NFL tackles at both spots and maybe one <laughs> as a backup. These multiple tight end formations are going to be pretty interesting. And I, I think there's a lot of top 20 caliber teams in the East, but I'm not sure there's a clear top 10 caliber team in the East. So I do think Georgia could actually run the table even if it suffers a couple injuries. Now, look, they could also regress. It's certainly possible they did lose a ton of talent. Uh, I have this at 11.3, so it's not like a strong bet for me, but I'm certainly not taking the under here uh, with the Bulldogs. I came in wanting to take the under. I think that was my hunch. I wanted to. Uh, then you start looking at the schedule. Uh, they're going to be... Was it 13, at least 13 point? They're 17 and a half favorites versus Oregon. I think they're going to be 13 point favorites in every game they play. I I think it's it's an easy path to a dynasty for Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. It's pretty remarkable because they're probably going to be back in the SEC title game. They'll probably be back in the playoff. And like how many challenges are on the schedule? So I think there is. So I think if it was 11 and a half, I would take the under on principle alone. And I think the stretch from October 29th to November 19th, where they have Florida in Jacksonville, Tennessee at home, at Mississippi State, and at Kentucky, I think that's where they slip up. Somewhere along that stretch is where they have a game. And if it was going to be, like I would say either Tennessee or Mississippi State are the prime upset targets because I think those teams can score points on a defense by getting the ball out, Going tempo like Tennessee is going to come at you. Mike Leach's system. I think those two teams could stress the defense and put some more pressure on the offense to have to score points, to have to open it up. So if I, I think they lose a game, but I'm not, there's no way I'm going under 11. Yeah. So I'm on the is, over. This is without a doubt a program that, like, it should not be a surprise that we're coming in and looking at this number. This is, they've won the SEC East four times out of the last five years. They've had top eight finishes in the final AP poll in each of the last five years. Since the breakthrough that was that 2017 season, they have only continued to recruit monsters and go out there and win double digit games. I just, it, it is uh, unlikely that we will see a regression that is all the way to 10 and two. I'm, I'm absolutely on the over as well here. I will say that, I think that the any hangover, like anytime you want to say like a, a Georgia might have a hangover, we might see some kind of regression, we might see some setback. I feel like it would only be in December or January. Like it would only like they're going to get to the yeah. SEC championship game. They will maybe, if not probably, be a contender for the college football playoff. And it's really only when Georgia has to go up against another uh, team with elite talent that I think we're going to see anything. Uh, that goes against the idea that this is, like you mentioned, Danny, an absolute dynasty under Kirby Smart. If Kirby's building this dynasty, this Alabama East, his big, he's already like, he he knocked the biggest hurdle yet was getting the first one. And he was close early, then he got it. Now the challenge is maintaining that excellence over time. And that's one thing that Nick Saban never lets off the gas, never lets off the pressure, doesn't let them 
you know, be complacent for a second. We don't know how that's going to feel in Georgia. There's still there's still a glow around Athens. They're feeling really good about themselves. How hungry are they? I think one thing is like guys like me and Bud who are like questioning Stetson Bennett. The more rat poison they can get, I think is good for them. And I think that's why Nick Saban looks for it. But everyone's pick, picking them to make the playoffs. So I wonder how they handled the success. Do they come out as hungry week by week? That to me is kind of the next evolution of this Georgia program. And we don't know how it's going to I mean. There haven't been many programs repeat over time. I mean, it was Nebraska and Alabama in the last 30 years, you know, are the only ones to do it. So we'll see if they can become the third. But it's it's challenging to get young players to stay invested. And a- another thing, another area, like we're all on the over, so we're all clearly high on Georgia. But a lot of the attention gets talked about with this team, like you're mentioning, Danny, like a championship hangover, then also like a defensive kind of just regression from being as good as it was. I don't think nearly enough attention is paid to how good the offense was last year like they because they don't have the top you know first round top 10 nfl quarterback pick there but if you look at their numbers like they were in the top 10 in just about a whole lot of important categories like you know just a success rate epa explosive passing they were in the top 10 but one thing where i think stetson bennett kind of comes and bites them and one area that they struggled last year was in the red zone they only scored touchdowns on 60 percent of their red zone trips which ranked 68th nationally it's the one area of that offense that really wasn't elite and i think that's one of those things if they face a defense that could get them in the red zone that is strong enough to kind of make the windows tighter and kind of force Stetson Bennett to force balls into windows that maybe he doesn't have the arm to do. Because another aspect, too, is like we think of Stetson Bennett as being a weakness. They were actually, for a lot of you know more advanced kind of metrics, they were a better passing team than they were a rushing team. But some of that was just based on the defenses they were facing, defenses loading up to stop the run. But if you could stop them from running the ball in the red zone and force Stetson Bennett to have to beat you with his arm, that is how you beat Georgia. How many teams can do that on the schedule? On the schedule, I I don't Three, think Oregon. Yeah, maybe. I don't think Oregon can Oregon can in week one, but maybe towards the end of the year, Oregon would be at a team that would be like capable of doing that. But Who's other the than best that, D line they play, Auburn maybe. I mean, it's just probably Auburn. Auburn yeah. probably. I South think Carolina could be decent up front. Mississippi State could be decent yeah. up front. So. Kentucky but yeah it's what it's gonna be Florida maybe it's just it's like there's teams I just I don't know if there's any teams offensively that will be able to score enough but like right. when they get to those games against other elite teams that's the one area where I think that they are weaker than some of the opponents they're likely to face and Kirby Smart by the way has to love when you're talking about trying to maintain a, like a razor's edge and a focus and stay on the gas pedal I, I mentioned the coaches poll is just released Georgia's nowhere close to number one Alabama is number one getting 54 first place votes of the 65 Ohio state at number two, Georgia checks in at number three. So he's, he's going to have at the beginning of the season, because I I expect that many, the AP poll will probably have Alabama and Ohio state one and two as well. And so the Bulldogs will be able to just operate, not in obscurity clearly, but at least not at the very, very center of, of the dartboard when it comes to college football. And that can be a great place to just go about your business, grind through, suffocate teams, do the boa constrictor thing, and then show up in Atlanta 13 and 0 ready to, uh, or show up in Atlanta 12 and 0 looking to try and win the sec championship. One really nerdy thing here. I do want to point out on Georgia is if it felt like you were always backed up in your own end when you played them last year, that's because you were. Yes. Uh, Georgia actually had 91% of kickoffs result in a touchback or inside the 25. So basically like you were never starting outside of the, not never, but very rarely starting outside of the 25. And that is a really big deal. It's sort of that hidden yards factor. That kid's gone, right? The the, the kid they had doing kickoffs for him. So uh, that could be a potential issue. He was also their punter, but they didn't punt that much. Mm Mm-hmm. I love that stat. I'm going all. I'm, give me the under. Give me the under. <laughs> We've got. Are you kidding? We've lost the hidden yards on kickoffs. This is it. This is how you win at the margins, baby. And also, like around eleven, like eleven on the dot. The one of the reasons we're all saying over is back to I think what Tom said at the very beginning. Yeah, they might slip up. Like there are places where we are finding on the margins. You could circle a game here. You could circle an aspect of the depth chart where there might be a question. But there ain't two questions. That's for sure.
So yep. Yep. everybody's leaning, leaning to the over uh, where you got a little bit of push insurance there at 11. Count them up. Two teams in the SEC East with a over-under win total of eight. We will begin with the Kentucky Wildcats. You want over eight, it's at minus 105. If you want under, it's at minus 125. Uh, boy, just a, just a real stoop special of a non-con here, playing Miami of Ohio, Youngstown State, and Northern Illinois. Just in his bag right there. Uh, obviously, the finale against Louisville, all four of those games are going to be at the big checkout line, Kroger Field. From the West, they have at Ole Miss and then Mississippi State at home. We get into division play. They will be welcoming South Carolina, Vanderbilt, and Georgia to Lexington, hitting the road to play Florida, Tennessee, and Missouri. Over under win to 10 wins last year, by the way. Second time, I think, in the last four years that this program has done it. If the floor has undoubtedly been raised, and the standard of Kentucky football is incredibly impressive. We do have some turnover on the offensive line and the defensive line, though the expectation under Mark Stoops is that the defense is, is going to be salty pretty much year in, year out. Chris Rodriguez, who also has his name mentioned here on the podcast, is like maybe the league's best running back, certainly uh, one of the more impressive backs that you're going to see, and Will Levis. He's more than just a viral video. He's more than just uh, an NFL draft curiosity or a, a, a buzzworthy target for NFL teams. He's somebody who's going to try to take over an offense, which has change over at offensive coordinator and try to be able to uh, push this thing forward, help Kentucky fight to finish second in the SEC East again. Will they do it? What are we doing with over under eight? Under. Mm -hmm. This is a high price to buy this Kentucky program. And I am a believer in looking at historical win totals. And we, we talked about this last year with Iowa State. Are we really convinced Iowa State was going to make another jump because their win total kept going up? This is sort of the same thing with Kentucky. I, I have them at 7.6, so for me this would be actually a play, like a small play, but I, I would bet this. Uh, I think they had huge losses with Wondell Robinson and, and Josh Ali. Like, that's 200 targets. Like, And without those guys, how bad would Will Levis's numbers have been? He was already 24 to 13 touchdown-interception ratio. Like, not a... He was not actually good last year. He's like talented, but he, and granted, he didn't enroll till summer. There's a real chance that I'm just totally wrong about this because now with a, another full year in not the same offense, but a really similar offense that I'm, I'm wrong. But they also lost some guys who got drafted and are going to be in NFL camps on both sides of the line. And, you know, Kirkland, Fortner and Rosenthal, and, and they lost some big, uh, the, the manual guy for them, or not manual. Um, gosh, that's, that's like a 90s Florida reference, Mark Juan Manuel. Uh, Mark Juan McCall. Uh, was really pretty good for them when he played. So I, I'm, I think this is more of a seven and five shot. I definitely don't want over eight. Under, uh, I, the turnover on, um, the turnover on offense, both on the sideline with the offensive coordinator and L, uh, pretty much everywhere other than the quarterback and the running back is enough for me to let Kentucky fall back to the pack. Right, that when I'm looking at at Florida, at Tennessee, at Missouri, one and two, right? You know, you you even start to look at, you know, is there a chance that they get got? Are they going to win at Ole Miss? Are, are they going to lose against Mississippi State at home? That draw from the West is you know, not the most difficult that you are going to have. Hello, Tennessee. Um, but it is not easy. And so I'm, I think that you're going to go in and you're going to get three or four wins in the non-conference. You're going to be able to get, you know, two to three wins in division play. But with the with the West draw right there, I I do think that seven and five is much more likely than nine and three. And that while Kentucky is still a very good team, I think that the rest of the division is getting better. Florida is not going to have the bottom fallout. Uh, if you believe that Tennessee and South Carolina are going to be able to build on exceeding expectations at all, life is only going to get more difficult for the Wildcats as the rest of the division gets better. They did an amazing job of capitalizing while everyone else was down, but I, I don't see nine and three here. So I'm also on the under. Do we know how long Chris Rodriguez is going to, is going to be suspended if, if he is like he's practicing with them, but you know, that summer DUI, like they play Florida in week what, two. What, I'm going to be suspended for a week. 
Yeah, yeah I, be a good week. I, I would, <laughs> would very much guess that he plays against Florida. He's yeah. like sneaky, really good. So yeah, that could be a big deal. Yeah, I'm on the under too. Um, for a lot of the same reasons you guys mentioned, I do think this hype train on Will Levis is interesting. He was at Penn State for two years behind Sean Clifford, and Penn State was like, "Now nah, we're good." With Sean Clifford, like. I don't know. I, the new offensive coordinator, I think, has been an issue. The turnovers are an issue. He's a little bit erratic with the ball. But most importantly, I think it goes back to what Bud and you said, Chip. Are we really ready to, uh, to trust Kentucky to just reload and go back-to-back -back right there? Feels more like they're a program that's more – has to be veteran-laden, a bunch of guys that you've, you've developed in the program, and the fact that they lost so much last year, plus the coordinator, plus I'm not sold on Will Levis. Give me the under all day. I'm on the push with a lean towards the under. And I, I I think you guys have gone over pretty much all the reasons. But for me, it's like this is not a simple schedule. I think they're going 3-0 and in non-conference. I think Miami of Ohio is going to be a pretty tough MAC team, but I don't see them giving Kentucky too much trouble. Youngstown State, I'm wearing the shirt, but I don't think they're going to give Kentucky any trouble. NIU is a team that I think we're not doing MAC win totals but if we were i would be very much on an niu regression from what they did last season and be on their win total under but chip you touched on it like this is a tough road schedule like a lot of the winnable games that kentucky needs to get over eight and get the nine wins at old miss at tennessee at mizzou those games add a little bit level of difficulty having to play them on the road i i agree there are much worse draws to get from the west than the mississippi schools but I think the Mississippi schools could be pretty decent this year. So I think that's tougher than it looks on the surface. You get towards the back end of the season and that's when the schedule gets kind of softer. You got Georgia there, but you know, Mizzou, Vandy back to back weeks. I feel like they could win those games. And I think it's really going to come down to that Louisville game. Like they have to win that game if they're going to finish over. But even then I think they might go into it at, you know, seven and four. So like winning that game would probably be more likely to make them eight and four than nine and three. So again, my numbers say push, but it's at like 7.8 for the projection. So it's a slight lean to the under. But again, from the historical win total point, we're talking about Kentucky and whether or not Kentucky is going to go nine and three. Yeah. This is a head coach who used to get bonuses. What at eight wins? Yeah. What was the, what was the Mark soup's best contract in the history of college sports? Oh, it's every time he, he wins seven games, he gets an automatic year extension. Every time they win 10 games and, and a bump. Every time he wins 10 games, uh, he gets an automatic, I think, two-year extension and mega bump. It's it's just the best contract in sports, but for both sides. Kentucky right. has set out realistic expectations that they do not ever really expect to contend for the East, as they should not. Uh, but they do want to do something in the basketball offseason that doesn't suck. So they're like, hey. Mark Stoops, can you build us a, a viable product so that we're actually watchable and people will come to Lexington more year round? As long as you're like, still, yeah, I got you. As long as you're winning more than you're losing, we want to be able to keep you around and continue to pay. And if you do pop up every now and then, we'll we'll add a lot more on there. So, yeah, Kentucky, uh, we got some push, we got some lean under, but uh, that's a that's a tall ask when we're talking about nine and three, given the turnovers in the trenches. How many games are going to win this fall? Quick point of order, uh, because a couple people in the chat have asked about this. This is regular season only, so we do not include mm -hmm. conference championship games and bowl games. If you're new to the betting space, totally understand. We're, that's why we call them regular season win totals. We're definitely not including bowl games or conference title games. Correct. Excellent point. Tennessee over under win total of eight. Uh, again, over is minus 105. Under is minus 125. The non-conference, we got Ball State, the return visit from last year's game against Pitt. That was quite a shootout. That one will be in Pittsburgh. Akron and UT Martin. Then, look, Tennessee has to play uh, Alabama every single year. Well, now we're also throwing in a trip to Baton Rouge to play LSU. Woo! At LSU and Alabama is your draw from the West. In division play at Georgia, at South Carolina, at Vanderbilt, with Florida, Kentucky, and Missouri all coming to Knoxville that November is all division games and three of them are on the road. We are talking about one of the most prolific offenses in the SEC that brings back a quarterback in Hendon Hooker and a top wide wide out target in Cedric Tillman. We're also talking about a Tennessee defense that gave up a bajillion yards through the air uh, every single game. So as Tennessee looks to try to take its step forward under Josh Heupel as the, as 
as, as Pete Helms, wherever he is, as, as he's walking around saying the Vols are back and getting ready to uh, come hang out with us on Saturday nights, as, as Jordan's watching this pod, what are we saying for the Vols over under eight wins? Under. It's a tough schedule. I am. There's way too much Tennessee hype heading into the 2022 season oh. i really do not understand like i under i get what caused it because like they were a fun team to watch last year and the offense was fun and hendon hooker come out came in and it, the whole team changed the season changed they scored a whole bunch of points blah 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 but they still had an awful defense and i don't know what has changed between last year and this year to mean that this defense is no longer going to be awful and when you have an awful defense it's really hard to win 9 games it's hard to win 8 games i don't think tennessee in 2022 is really going to be any different than the tennessee we saw in 2021 they're going to play fun games they're going to lose a lot of fun games they're going to win a lot of fun games and they're going to end up probably about 7 and 5 I'm right on this number. So, Ooh. like, it's not a play for me. I, I I will say, like, I think their offense will continue to roll right along. I mean, they, they should be really, really good on offense. People are like, oh, they're going to adjust to this stuff. Have they adjusted to what Kendall Browse runs at Arkansas yet? How, how's, how's that adjustment going? Right? Did, did the Big 12 actually adjust to what Browse ran at Baylor? Not really. This offense is basically a cheat code to win a lot of games in college football. Now, you may say, hey, when they play a Georgia or Bama – kind of changes and i agree but you know what everybody else's offense changes when you play those those defenses too for the most part unless you have just freak athletes i have these guys tied for 10th in my power rating and i'm still not betting the over so that should tell you the difficulty of the schedule here right like they have a lot of games that they could lose i think lsu is they're actually favored by four and a half right now in in the look aheads in vegas at, at the superbook the westgate tigers, tigers. Uh, Totally disagree with that. Yeah, exactly. I, I, Wait, I they're favored some... by four and a half at LSU? In Baton Rouge. I, that's I... why I took LSU. I was like, mm, okay. To the kiosk I go. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, – I don't think they should be favored in, in that game, much less by four and a half. I think this is a pretty damn good team, but it also has real downside risk because they lost some important guys on that defensive line, even though I like their back seven. Uh, if they have a cup, like a guy or two go down – I really don't know if they have difference makers up front that can get them over this number. But if they stay healthy, they could win nine or ten games. At Pitt is a game that I I gave to Pitt um, when I was doing the ACC win totals. And that's looking at Pitt actually having a defense that might be able to cause some problems and show some resistance. You know, they did it a year ago. They're not going to have as much offensive firepower. They can't win that game in the same style that they did last year, I don't think. So I've got them going three and one there. I've got them dropping both of the games to LSU. I think at South Carolina is really tricky. And so now we're starting to look at, are you going to go three and zero at home against Florida, Kentucky, and Missouri? Absolutely something that you're capable of doing. But if you pick up at a loss at Georgia, a loss at South Carolina, now all of a sudden one, two, three, four, five, there you go. You're seven and five. Um, so I've, I, I found it easier to find the losses than it is for me to be able to get all the way up to the wins and so, uh, especially with those those three road games all in November into the season, if there's any depth issues at all, that's going to be exposed right there. Uh, I am I am on probably push, but put but seven and five is definitely something I would uh, I would think is more likely than nine and three. Um, I wish I could go back and read some of my tweets from Tennessee fans over the years because I have had a field day trolling this fan base when they come in with massive expectations and they fall short. I'm on the Vols this year. Over. And I'm over. Give me the over. They have the second best quarterback in the SEC. You guys know how I feel about Hendon Hooker. I love what he's got. I And here's the other thing, too. Like LSU, it's not surprising to me at all. They're favored by four and a half. LSU has been back to back 500 teams. Like they're, they're still rebuilding. We don't even know who their quarterback is going to be. Is it one of four guys right now is what I'm hearing. Florida is a question mark. Like these teams that for the last decade, Tennessee has struggled against all have significant question marks. Um, the pit game I think is really interesting. And I know last year, so they made the switch to Hooker, but they weren't tra they were actually leading when they made the switch in to the Hooker at quarterback in the game. Mm -hmm. But I think the consistency, knowing who your guy is, Pitt's not exactly going to be a hostile environment to go into. 
you know, it'll be loud. It'll be good for Pitt, but it's not going to be like going on the road in the SEC. I think they win that game. Um, I got them over. I think if their defense and, and Tom, you are a hundred percent right. And there was a big difference in Ole Miss from the year they hired a new defensive coordinator and they got better, but I am trusting the defense to get better and they can't get any worse. If they're the same, they're going to be garbage again. They can't win every game in a shootout, but I think they're going to be better. So give me the over on the balls. All right. Okay. Uh, can't believe you. What? Can't believe you're falling for it, Daniel. I know. No, it's hey, listen. It's, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad somebody was here to give the the rabid. I'm I'm glad that we don't have golf balls coming at the Cover Three podcast. I'm glad <laughs> right. that someone is going to be shielded from the mustard and the big golf balls that are co- coming down from the stands. Count them up. The Florida Gators year one with Billy Napier over under win total set at seven. Uh, price at the Caesar Sportsbook at minus 135 to the over, plus 105 to the under. Huge non-con game right at the start of the season. Utah coming to town, and really the, the whole start of the season. You start off with uh, Utah at home, then here comes Kentucky. Boy, these are these are like Tennessee at the end of September. Uh, full non-con is Utah, USF, Eastern Washington. Then the Florida State game will be in Tallahassee. Your draw from the West, the LSU game that you play every year, that's going to be at home. But then you're rotating in Texas A&M. That will be on the road. You also have a little bit of a slight scheduling advantage as the neutral site game against Georgia counts as one of your road games. Uh, So you've got a a more full home slate. Kentucky, Missouri, South Carolina all come into the swamp. Tennessee in Knoxville, Vanderbilt in Nashville. So with Billy Napier coming in, Anthony Richardson in full control of this offense, you can find you can find players on this depth chart that you are excited about and that you feel are worthy of a Florida team that is going to live up to uh, the, the expectations of being one of the better teams in the SEC East, one of the better teams in the SEC. Billy Napier himself, has cited concerns about depth and whether there are enough of those players to feel really confident about, uh, you know, getting this roster to the place where it needs to be tough schedule, you know, Utah, LSU, Texas, A&M, Florida state, obviously, but what are we doing with over under seven? I'm curious to see what you guys do with this because I'm literally on 7.04. So I'm going over. Yeah, I'm over. Yeah, like I, you are? Okay. Yeah. I, um, I, I think Georgia at Texas A&M are losses. So throw those right out. Like back-to-back weeks, even coming off a bye, that's just really, really tough. Like if you survive the Georgia game, then you're going on the road to College Station the week after. And Chip, you just mentioned the depth issues. So who knows? Like they might be really bruised and battered for that game. But like Utah in week one. You would think, you know, Utah st- starting the season in the top 10 of the coaches poll, starting the top six in the CBS 130, and it's probably going to be in the top 10 of the AP poll when it comes out. But, like, we've seen how that goes when non-SEC teams play SEC teams in the opening week of the season, and those are usually at neutral sites. This one's in Gainesville. So while I think Utah should be favored in that game slightly, I think Florida has a much better shot of winning that game than most people are giving them credit for. I think Kentucky at home is very winnable. I think USF at home is a win. At Tennessee could be tricky, but again, I just I, Tennessee's defense is so terrible. I just went over it. I don't really want to trust them against anybody. So, like when I look at this very the first seven games of the season before that by, they could be six and one, five and two at worst. I think is how that's going to go. And then you get to the losses at Georgia A and M, and then South Carolina at home. I give them the win there, but again, the depth issues once they get late in the season is when I really think that stuff could come back to bite them and really start hurting them. But Vanderbilt on the road is a win, and Florida State on the road. I know it's a rivalry game, but until Florida State really starts showing me something more than it's shown in the last few years, I have a difficult time thinking the Seminoles are going to beat the Gators in that spot. So I think this team's getting to 8-4. and Like I see two definite losses, and I see a whole bunch of winnable games outside of that. They're not – I don't think the Gators are going to go undefeated at home, but they could. Yeah. I think that six and one in Gainesville is a very realistic possibility. So go and get me one, maybe two wins from at Tennessee, at Florida State, at Vanderbilt, at Texas AM. Like I I I am on the over 
and I think I'm giving I'm giving the Utah win to Florida. I do agree with the hot start theory that Tom just laid out here, and I think that pairs very well with, as you mentioned, a team that has some depth concerns. I think that Anthony Richardson's going to be awesome. I I think that he is going to be a very uh, effective quarterback, and that what we saw from Levi Lewis and uh, his time with the Raging Cajuns, as you know, they were just rolling through the Sunbelt West division, locking that thing up by like mid October, every single year, making it to the Sunbelt championship game every single year. I, I think that it's possible that Anthony Richardson is, is going to be the exact quarterback for Billy Nape, what Billy Napier wants to do with this Gators offense. I think it's going to be uh, very easy for me to flush what I saw as Florida went two and six in sec play last year. Cause the bottom fell out, man. Like it was just, it, it was a team that had lost its way. Um, and a team that, by the way, also had Alabama at the very, very end. I just think that we can discount and discredit some of the statistical evidence and some of what our eyes even told us about this being a downright bad team and that just being able to come in and flip the switch and, and be able to jump up in their win total, be able to go from being six and six to eight and four, just changing in Billy Napier, having a quarterback who is a good fit. All that stuff could happen. So I, I'm on the over here with the Gators. All right. I, I guess I'll just be the contrarian and take the under for record keep purposes. I, I, obviously, it's not a bet for me. A couple things, though, if I'm going to argue against against the overs, because I think you guys may be on the right side here. So I'm just going to try to. Number one, the fact that they played those defensive tackles they took last year from Auburn as much as they did tells me that that defensive tackle room is one of the worst in the SEC, especially depth-wise. If Dexter goes down, they're playing a bunch of guys who I don't think would play at almost any other school in the East. Okay. So they are like one injury away on the defensive interior from being really in trouble against any team that can run the ball. Uh, I'm not sold on their receivers at all yet. I actually think the Pearsall take from Arizona State is much needed. Like they needed somebody who can actually run routes and catch the ball. Uh, Shorter to me has always just been about potential, he has always had drops issues. So maybe he can finally catch it. He looks like Ter- you know Terrell Owens physically. I mean, the guy's I mean, he's a little stiff, but he's got great long speed and can can jump. And when he catches it, it's it's nice. I will note that when Napier was winning the West in the Sun Belt for the last two years, not a single Sun Belt team from the West made a bowl game. So while it is impressive that he built up Louisiana's roster to you know be the dominant team in that league, they also had really easy competition almost every week. Like they were playing a bunch of nothings uh, in that league. And this will be a different challenge for them to play tougher games each week. Like Florida is not going to be a 21 point favorite like Louisiana you know, averaged in conference games the last couple of years. You have to actually prepare for each game. We'll see how well they do that. And I also wonder, like, I think Richardson has all the talent in the world, but I don't like that he was fighting for playing time with Emory Jones, who I don't think is very good. Finally, I think you have to adjust these guys up a little bit because I do think a, as Chip mentioned, they played with Bama, and they really played with Georgia for about the first 15 minutes or so, and then then it kind of piled on. But that was longer than some teams did. Uh, but they also like totally quit against South Carolina. So I know in the chat they're telling us, hey, South Carolina beat these guys last year big time. They're better this year. That margin will be smaller this year, I guarantee mm-hmm. you. Like, that was a team that quit last year in the middle of the season on Mullen. Uh, and they grant them too, like defensively. Yeah. They, I mean, yeah. it was just like, and I think quarterback, the way the quarterbacks were coached, the way the defense was coached, I, I think all of it is questionable and stuff I'm willing to overlook. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, I, I'm, I don't have a bet on this. I just, I was trying to play contrarian here. I, I actually think the number is pretty good at seven. Um, I kind of want to go contrarian, bud, and give the to take, but I'm on the over. Um, if if Billy Napier is six and six, that would be the worst start like in the last 20 years for a first time head coach, like since they've been cycling through, it'd be better. You know, Zook, Muschamp, McElwain, they all started at least with, I think eight or eight wins. Um, It would be a brutal start to the Napier era, which already I've talked to some Gator buddies and they're like, eh, I don't know. They're like, I cannot believe they're already like nervous about the hire, which shows you the, the culture of what they're trying to accomplish and the expectation coming in. I would push back Chip a little bit on the Anthony Richardson's going to be awesome. I agree with everything you said. He looked a little overwhelmed last year, and Dan Mullen is a quarterback guru. Like, how come Dan Mullen couldn't get that version out of him, and how come he couldn't get past Emory Jones? So I'm a little bit worried about that. But 
here's why I'm on the over. Either Anthony, he figures out and builds an offense around Anthony Richardson or Jack Miller comes in at some point. So that's right. You're and, a big Jack mm-hmm. Miller guy. I am. I was surprised. But, I mean, Billy Napier has pretty much shut the door on that. But the way he's been, you know, heaping praise on Anthony Richardson. So, but I think whoever's playing quarterback, you'll get better play than you got last year. Um, I had him at six wins, kind of automatic, like pretty easy. Like, you know, all right, not even really thinking about it. And in the other six games, if you can't get me two out of those, then we got problems. So I think it's a pretty easy over. I think seven is a worst case scenario. So I'm on the over. And another like way to look at this too, like if going off like Bud, you mentioned earlier when talking about Kentucky, like looking at historical win totals and just historic, you know, performance is a good guideline for how things are going to go. Like Florida has consistently been one of the two best teams in this division for a very long time. Last year. The f- bottom completely dropped out. There was a little mess with the coaching staff, everything off the field. You mentioned the team quitting pretty much during that South Carolina game. This team went two and six in the SEC with a point differential of minus one. And yeah. I, I wonder, like we talk about, like Tennessee is getting hype going into this season. You know, South Carolina is getting hype going into this season. Is that hype something they've truly earned? Or is that a result of Florida just being down and everybody kind of writing the Gators off a little too easily? Like if Florida was good last year, because remember, it did beat Tennessee by 24 earlier in the season before everything completely fell apart. Like, are we that high on Tennessee or South Carolina or any of these other programs in the division as possible teams in finishing second place? Or is order just kind of going to be restored where, no, Florida's nowhere near Georgia's level. But while its recruiting has dropped off to places where, you know, the fan base didn't want it, and we've seen other programs in the division kind of pick it up lately, they don't have the length of recruiting. Like, Tennessee's had a great class this year, but the last few years it hasn't really been to a key standard where you think that they're ready to really take a huge step forward. So is it more likely that Florida just bounces back and goes 4-4-5-3 four and four and five and three in the division and finishes in second place, or are those teams poised to take big leaps forward? I tend to think it's more likely Florida just reverts to its usual form. And we all realize why Dan Mullen got heat for the recruiting trail. It was because he wasn't top three Mm -hmm. he was top 10 i think every year wasn't he bud like they were pretty good like it's just by their standard they were tired of watching georgia have a one or two class every year and and dan mullen's like what more do you want me to do and they're like that so i think it's i'm with i'm more leaning towards tom if chip if you're right and anthony richardson is special oh then i think then it's they could be 10 and two like they could be really good that's yeah. what I think is kind of scary. That's why I think people are sleeping on the Gators. I just am not ready to say Anthony Richardson is going to be special. He just looked a little overwhelmed last year. I got to see him play a little better. And much like DJ last year, like I I wonder how the, the Utah game is going to impact him. Like if he plays good and they win, it could propel them and kick them off. But if he struggles, you know, what do they – they're going to be fans booing like is Anthony Rich you know let's get in the backup like that becomes an issue to me for Florida so a lot hinging on that game I that game is fascinating I cannot wait to see that game because I think Utah is really good but that heat I mean I was just in Salt Lake it's hot out there but it's not a swamp you know I know it's night it's just it's a different level they better be you know practicing in a sauna or something getting ready for it God, it's great to have Gator Dan back on board here. Ready, he's <laughs> loaded up for the 2022 season. Coming up on the other side, we mentioned that South Carolina hype. What has Spencer Rattler's arrival done for the expectation for the Gamecocks, plus Missouri, Vanderbilt, the coaches poll, and Kale Gundy's resignation at Oklahoma? All that and more next. Now that you've seen them do the universe, it's time for them to do a new series. David, what are you doing? Uh, uh, nothing. <laughs> This is going to be cool. Well, we just came here to break stuff. Fire! Uh. Hey, hey, what are you doing? Ah. Beavis and Butthead are back with an all-new series, now streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Peloton, it's, it's not just about bikes and treadmills. It's about a team of instructors ready to motivate you 24-7. There's thousands of classes ranging from strength training and yoga to running to boxing. It's the perfect non-judgmental space to experiment with a new type of movement and a level and a pace that feels good for you. 
It's also great to work around your schedule. Like if you're super busy, then you can always find the kind of class that works for you. Danny, you just told us that you were just getting on the bike before you came on here. You had the morning radio show. You've got the Cover 3 podcast. Like, What do you like about the way that you can work it around your busy schedule? Are you kidding me? It's the best. I get on there anytime I want. I get it. And you know what I love about it? Competing against other people like mm -hmm. Tom. When I get in there and I see his name on the leaderboard, I'm like, I can't let him get past me. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, go ahead, Tom. I was going to say, that is one of the key things too. Like I, since I got my Peloton, I got it in 2020 during the pandemic, like a lot of people. And it is really the first time where I've worked out and I actually look forward to working out and I enjoy working out. And that's one of the aspects of it, Danny, because it's like, you know, you have the leaderboard and there's just the competitive juices get flowing when you see other people like passing you or other people you can pass. It keeps you motivated and keeps you going. And I just it's one of the best aspects of Peloton to me. You can find these two on leaderboards all across the Peloton network. We've heard about all the awesome instructors. And what about the iconic music? Are you in the mood to blast 90s hip hop? Well, there's a class for that. Maybe it's been a tough day and you just need to ugly cry to some power ballads. Well, there's a class for that. If you want a Pride Month playlist that's going to get your blood pumping, yep, there's a class for that. Whatever you're into, Peloton has the music that will get you moving. The competitiveness, the music, the great motivation from these instructors. It's all a reason why you need to jump on board and try out Peloton. And you can try the Peloton bike or tread risk-free for 30 days. Learn more at OnePeloton.com. Once again, that is O-N-E Peloton, P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com. OnePeloton.com. New members only. Terms apply. Find the motivation that moves you. Motivation you can get anytime, anywhere. I did 20 miles yesterday. 20? Mm hmm Just a typical Sunday in the Fernelli household. Wow. Works around your schedule. Love it. South Carolina over under win total of six wins minus 140 to the over plus 110 to the under at Caesar Sportsbook. The non-conference slate, we go Georgia State, Charlotte, South Carolina State, and then the finale at Clemson. The draw from the West, the Texas A&M game will be in Columbia. You also have at Arkansas on there. Get into division play, and Kentucky, Vanderbilt, and Florida is going to be your road slate. Georgia, Missouri, Tennessee, all at home. This is an offense that had negligible quarterback play at the Power 5 level throughout the season last year and found a way to make it to a bowl game. Now they have Spencer Rattler. Spencer Rattler, who played some of his best football at Oklahoma at a time when Shane Beamer, now South Carolina coach, was on the staff. Some of the reports from uh, you know the way that things have been going so far indicate that Rattler's looking very good and getting closer to you know, showing on the field on Saturdays some of that potential that led to his very, very high projection coming out of high school. The South Carolina hype train is rolling. What are we doing with six wins? Again, minus 140 to the over, plus 110 to the under. Over. Now, Coco may have this graphic. I already hit this back in May. Uh, I actually grabbed five and a half to the over at minus 140, which I thought was just flat stealing. Uh, I, I have these guys at 6.6, .6, so that's a solid over for me. Um, it's almost 6.7, so if we're really interested in decimals. Look, this was not a good football team last year, okay? They were probably like two net wins lucky. And I'm talking about not like, hey, they were unlucky, of course, to have their quarterbacks go down. But as far as the quality of play on the field versus their actual record, this was not a good team. It was kind of a bad team that was very lucky that they had the record they had. And I bet them over last year three and a half and four and a half because I got it early again and also bet it on the show. Uh, and I'm a believer in this team. They didn't have any quarterback play last year at all. I mean, it was terrible. Like Luke Doty, hot garbage, you know, Jason, Jason Brown, eight to six touchdown interception ratio. Yeah. Like it was, it was, it was bad. Um, I think that they can go from a team that I had rated in the eighties, right? Cause I don't use bowl games. I, I think North Carolina didn't care to be there that day. And that, I think that messes up my power ratings if I include some of these non-playoff bowl games to a team that can be like a top 40 type team. And a top 40 type team has a pretty good chance of making a bowl and a decent chance of winning seven games against this schedule. So I, I'm on the over. I think Spencer Rattler will help quite a bit. 
I like the offensive line experience, even though it was bad last year. Like, you know, they're at least not young and bad. They could, in theory, be better. Defensive line should be one of the better ones in the division. Uh, give me the over. Push. <laughs> With a slight lean to the under. I do agree with you, though, on a lot of what you're saying. Because this South like South Carolina's offense, you said it was really bad last year. Like, just like success rate. They were, at, I think, 101st. EPA on offense, they were, I think, about 99th. And then we I talked earlier, like, Georgia struggles in the red zone as far as finishing and scoring touchdowns. South Carolina scored touchdowns on 48.8% of its red zone possessions last year, which was 118th. And we have spent a lot of time on this show debating how good Spencer Rattler truly is compared to where he was rated as a recruit. But regardless of if he ever lives up to being the number one QB in his class and like the Heisman favorite going into last season and all that stuff, he's a definitive upgrade on what South Carolina had at quarterback. So this offense is going to improve. But where the problems start is the schedule still the schedule. They've got to go to Arkansas. They've got Georgia. They have to go to Kentucky. They get A&M. So it's like that draw from the West at Arkansas, A&M, not fun. You got Florida on the road, and then you finish with Clemson on the road. Odds are they're going to be losing at least, you know, 67, two-thirds of those games. So it's it's going to come down to how perfect can you be at home in the other games that are, you know, gimmies or the coin flips. And I just – don't think that this team, I think this team's going to be better, but I still think they're going to be six and six most likely. And my number has them at 5.8. So it's not a play for me as far as the under, but just for the purpose of the show under, but it's a push. Over. Um, and I, I'm doing this, honestly, I'm like, I, I will, I will circle back on this and I will make sure that I hold myself accountable when we do the West on Wednesday. But as I was lining up, you know, all of the, the games here that we had to break down, I think that Texas A&M is going to lose at South Carolina. I think that's my it-would-be-hilarious game of the SEC so far because Texas A&M is at Alabama on October 8th in the game of the year. Like, all things considered. You know, everything that's around Texas A&M, everything around Alabama, the Jimbo Fisher, Nick Saban spat, it, like, that game – is going to be absolutely massive. CBS has an SEC on CBS doubleheader with one game at 3.30, one game at 8 p.m. on October 8th. I don't have any inside information. I would place a show bet that one of those two games on that massive Saturday is going to be Texas A&M and Alabama. So there's you're going to get so high for that game. By week, right on the other side of that for the October 15th. And when does Texas A&M return to action? October 22nd at South Carolina. Trappy, 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 trappy spot. South Carolina is going to be hyped with the Aggies in town. The Aggies will probably be nationally ranked because when you lose to Alabama, you don't ever fall in the rankings. Heck, you might move up in the rankings if you play them close enough. And so I will circle back on this, but I've got South Carolina knocking off Texas A&M, and that's kind of what gives me the, the comfort and the flexibility to be able to say over here because clearly that's going to mess with the numbers in a way that projections don't because projections are going to favor the Aggies. I think that Spencer Rattler is at least one win on your final win total. They went 6-6 six and six last year. Spencer Rattler can take me over to the top. They've got similar to uh, what I said with Florida where you go up and down the depth chart and you can single out players that you like a lot that would start at a lot of other SEC teams. The whole depth chart isn't full, filled with them, but at least there is enough of the, that high-end potential where I, I think that this is going to be a Gamecocks team that is, uh, that's going to be able to build on the success of last season. I think South Carolina goes 7-5. and five. Uh, Missouri and Tennessee, key games that you're going to need to get to this win total. Those games are at home. Um, it's it's gonna be uh it's gonna be a fun season to see if uh, Shane Beamer can build on it. I think they do. I go over. All right. So I feel like there were two teams coming in with a lot of hype: Tennessee and South Carolina and Kentucky. But I know, like they've, I think Kentucky's had more success than those other two as of late. Um, I feel like I couldn't be bullish on both. I think six and six is probably the outcome for South Carolina. I'll go under again just to play the contrarian. I love Shane Beamer. I love the culture that he has built. He has players buying in. They're passionate. They buy his message. 
I know there is a talent upgrade at quarterback. I still have massive concerns about Spencer Rattler. Like what happens if things go bad? What happens? I mean, and they're not going to be undefeated, but when they lose multiple games, is he going to start blaming his guys, blaming his offensive linemen? I just need to see him grow up. And I've heard he's grown up and I've heard he's done, you know, the things that he needs to do to be a leader in that locker room. But it's easy to lead when you haven't lost anything yet and you haven't had a bad game and your receivers haven't dropped a ball and you haven't been blown out uh, you know, or lose on the road against Arkansas, which I don't know. I think they lose that game early. I just, I'm not sold on Rattler. So I'm going to go with the under, but I think six and six is probably the right number. Bud? Muted, bud. Unmute. Bud, we can't hear you. Apologies. My ceiling fan was making a bunch of noise, so I got up <laughs> to, to try to just kill this thing for the second time in the show uh quick injury slash betting update uh, if i'm watching my screen here uh antoine green is announced out six to ten weeks with a collarbone injury that's a fairly significant loss for north carolina as chip can tell you that number sitting three uh going to two and a half in a couple spots so if you like appalachian state uh, and you want to get the three at home you probably need to do that before we get off this show because it's going to go to two and a half i think to your point danny um Three and three to start the year. How do they handle adversity at Arkansas, Georgia, and then at Kentucky? All that before um, hitting their bye, which leads into Texas A and M. So that that would need to be something where what the the culture, you know, what the big the big C word that whatever uh, has been built there that with Shane Beamer, they're going to need to lean on it because they're going to take their lumps early. Can they rally and be able to finish strong? That'll be definitely something to watch. How many games are going to win this fall? The Missouri Tigers have an over-under win total of five with uh, the over at minus 140, the under at plus 110 at Caesar Sportsbook. At Louisiana Tech at Kansas State, Abilene Christian, and New Mexico State is the non-conference. From the West, the Arkansas game will be at home. You also draw at Auburn. So kind of, I, I guess, favorable. Oh, all things considered, when you're looking at SEC West draws, then in the East, in division play, you go at Florida, at South Carolina, at Tennessee, uh, Georgia, Vanderbilt, Kentucky, all coming to play Missouri. This is um, this is a Missouri team that has, like, so you've got uh, Luther Burden, right? Five-star wide receiver. The yep. big, big recruiting splash. Also now needs to be like a, a very big part of the offense ne needs to be able to hit the ground running. Um, Tyler cook gave the Tigers a little bit of a spark at the quarterback position at the end of last year. Connor Bazelak, of course was transferred out. He's now at Indiana. Can the alpha nerd get the Tigers to a bowl game? What are we doing with over under five? This should be a sweep. I think just based on where the number is, it's, under? it's an over for me. Oh, um, because like there's some books that have six or some books that have five and a half. This is one of the rare teams that actually has a full win spread. So like five, you may think they go under. If you want to bet the under, bet this somewhere else. If you want to bet the over, bet it at Caesars because like Caesars has the over under of, of five. I don't even think this team is that good. And I'm still going over for show pick purposes because it's five. And they got I four do kind of trust too, the alpha right? to score, you know? Do you think uh, at Kansas State is a lock? No, I don't think at Kansas State is a lock. I, I think they're going to lose that game. And they're going to lose to Vanderbilt. <laughs> that is pretty doubtful. I have them as 18-point uh, favorites over Vanderbilt. But, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll get out of the way. I'll go over. You like the over, but you don't like it at minus 140, do you? I certainly like it better than the under. Yeah. I've got them at like 5.6. See, I have them at four automatic lock wins that you don't even think about. I feel like they'll get one more to push it. And then how that's why I think being over makes the most sense. But I don't love it. Because <laughs> it's tough to look at this team and have like the that's that's why I wanted to mention Luther Burden because it's awesome. You got a five star wide receiver who's like good, like recruiting win. But when those players show up and you're automatically one of the most talented players on the whole team, it's like Okay, like <laughs> we need to have a, we need to have you come in and be able to flash as a freshman, then maybe take over as as the real star of the offense as a sophomore and junior. A lot to ask for the 
the 5'11 wide out for him to come in and immediately be a superstar. And he could be, but I just, I think as I look at the depth chart, I find myself, um, I find myself looking at a team that I can quickly slot behind the other teams that we have discussed so far uh, on this, on this show. I'm under push to put under for the show. Um, Look at this. There's a very real chance they're going to start two and four. Like they'll win against Louisiana Tech and Abilene Christian, but I could easily see them losing at Kansas State, at Auburn, at home against Georgia, and then at Florida. So this is a team that could be, you know, 0 and 3 in the SEC, 2 and 4 overall going into its mid October bye. And then I'll give them the win over Vandy at home when they come back from the bye. But I think they probably lose on the road at South Carolina. Kentucky game at home, somewhat of a coin flip. But th- if just going into that South Carolina game, this is suddenly now I've got them at three and five. So to get over, they'd have to win three of four against Kentucky at Tennessee, New Mexico State, Arkansas. I'll give them New Mexico State. So now they've got to win two of the three at Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas. How confident are you based on what you've seen Mizzou the last few years that this team is going to do? Because, but we've talked about it. Like Connor Basilak's gone. They were going after JT Daniels. Didn't get him. I don't know what really to expect. There's a new offensive coordinator. I don't know what to expect from the quarterback position with this team. Durden's a five-star receiver. That's great. Maybe he covers up a whole lot of mistakes right away. Or maybe he's a freshman and he doesn't just take the world over by storm and he needs some time to adjust. So I just... It's not that I don't think this team can get to a bowl. It's just I have way too many questions at this point, this close to the season, to have any real kind of confidence in saying this team's going to go over. Tom, I get that. I just think, like, at five, they're going to go 3-1 in the non-conference or 4-0. and If they beat Kansas State, they're going over, right? If they lose to Kansas State, they're going to beat Vanderbilt, I would assume. Like, they're going to they're gonna be bigger favorites over Vanderbilt than they are losing a Tech, I think. Um they need to get one more win in the SEC to push. Like, can they get one non-Vanderbilt win? Maybe that's a Florida team that doesn't have its act together. Maybe that's Auburn because they can't pass the ball. You know, maybe that's hosting Arkansas. Or what if South Carolina is not as good as we think? Like, I just – I have a hard time seeing them go 4-8. and eight. Florida, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Auburn are all games that if they were at home, you would like Missouri more. But they're – because sure. they are all, like, coin flippy type games, but they're all on the road. So how much, like Georgia, you're not going to pick that game. Georgia, Kentucky, and Arkansas, can you get one of those? I think that's sort of like one of your like your your key uh, measures that you're looking for right here. And look, I'm not going to put it past the alpha nerd, right? He's, Missouri has pulled out some inexplicable results. And so it's definitely possible. But I've, I've got, I think five and seven is probably the most likely uh, outcome. I did not know that about the market, bud. That's interesting. So in... I will, I will butt Elliot this and say I'm not going to rush to bet it, but uh, I'll, I'll say uh, I'll say push to under for for my official call here. But yeah, another question I'll ask you guys then, because Chip, you're also on the under with me. But what is Missouri football? What does it hang its hat on? Like, what have you seen from this program the last few years where it's like this is the hallmark of what this team is doing? I think it's got the capability to score points. Clearly, like you still have pretty good buy-in from the players there based on on the like it's hard to recruit at a really high level if you don't have buy-in from the players because you're gonna get recruits on campus and they're gonna talk to the current players and you can kind of tell, you know, if, if the atmosphere there sucks. So I think they still have belief and I think they still have the ability to score. It would also be hard for their defense to be worse than it was last year. Like it's possible, but uh, I mean they were. It was very bad. They were like outside the top 100, and I, yeah. I just don't think that's going to happen again. No, I just see that's things like they've changed. If the offense was good, okay, then why are they changing coordinators? It's like I just don't yeah. understand what's going on. And defensively, they were awful, just god awful. And I think, really yeah, and that's why it's like it's one of the same reasons I'm down on Tennessee. It's like so if I'm going to be down on Tennessee, which had a much better offense than Mizzou, but is pairing it with an awful defense. I don't have nearly as much faith in Mizzou's offense that I do Tennessee's, and its defense was just as bad. Of course, the win totals a few wins lower, so that plays a key role. It's just, I don't know, man. I feel like somebody in this division is going to pay the price and have to lose games, and it can't just be Vandy. So I think Missouri is the prime target to be that team. Count them up! 
the Vanderbilt Commodores over under win total of two and a half wins at the Caesars Sportsbook, and the over is priced at plus value, plus 110, the under at minus 140. The non-con starts right in week zero at Hawaii for the debut of Timmy Chang with the Warriors. They will get Elon when they get back on the mainland. Uh, Wake Forest will also be a home game, and then they are at NIU. The draw from the West, uh, the Tyler Steen revenge game uh, against Alabama and Tuscaloosa. Uh, Ole Miss will be coming to Nashville. The rest of the conference uh, in division play uh, at Georgia, at Missouri, at Kentucky, while they will be hosting South Carolina, Florida, and Tennessee. We're all about, like, listen, Clark Lee has set the goal for what the Vanderbilt football program can be. They have made efforts to try and improve overall team speed um, throughout this program. What do we see from the Commodores? Can they go and get three wins this season? Listen to me. I'm looking you dead in the eye, world. This total is just straight up disrespectful. Not only am I taking the over two and a half wins at the plus juice, but I'm telling you right now, right here in front of the whole world, they'll hit the over before September ends. Let's go. They will beat Hawaii on the road to start the season. They will beat Elon in the home opener. They'll probably lose to Wake Forest at home, but then they'll go on the road and they will beat Northern Illinois, a team that had some of the craziest luck that I've ever seen that is a very one-dimensional offense. And if there's anything I think Clark Lee and his team's going to be able to do, it's going to be able to slow down a very one-dimensional offense that can't throw the ball. And I think Vandy is 3-1 and one after its first four games, and we are cashing this ticket really early. And Bad then um, carrying the momentum from three and one. Beat Alabama. God, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> In Tuscaloosa, no less. All right. I have a feeling we will get the clean sleep on this one. Why? Because I am 100% agreeing with Tom. I And I don't like taking win totals. I don't have to wait four months for this thing to play out. I think this will be over. It better be over uh, by, by September 17th. If it's going to be a winner. Why is it juiced to the under at minus 140? Can anybody tell me that? Because it opened one and a half. Really? I actually got drinks with the guy that opened at one and a half uh, on Saturday night. And uh, basically, like, I think they just got a flood of money. And now some people are buying back on the two and a half. I, I could see them going under on this, Dan. Like, I I'll let you finish. But, like, I, I do know it did open one and a half. No, and I'm, I'm everything hard. with Tom. I'm all in on the over. I'm sort of just in a no bet range here. Like I, I'm agree with Tom that I do not think that North, Northern Illinois was anywhere near as good as they were, as their record said they were last year. But I think NIU actually could be improved. Like they won't be as lucky as they were last year, but they could be just actually a better football team than they were last year. I think Hawaii should should be a, a win for Vanderbilt. Hawaii lost a ton. Uh, Elon is is most likely a win. However, I have them as 21 point dogs in all games after that. I actually did play them under a half SEC win at plus plus 140 at DraftKings. Um, but I feel like that's a much better... If you want to play them under, I think you, you need to bet on the certainty of the SEC athlete disparity right now, which they're working to correct, obviously, but it's going to take a couple years. I probably would not play the two and a half under. Uh, there, there's a chance that this team is better just on a field position basis, right? So if you look at this, they inherited a mess roster-wise. I think it's going to be a slow burn to get out of that mess, especially because the portal has hurt them a little bit this offseason in terms of losing guys. Like they got a kid who might start at Alabama now at offensive tackle who they lost, Tyler Steen. But they were 130th in kick returns last year. I don't think they had a single kick return that went outside of the 30. That's kind of nuts. They were bottom 10 in punting, kicking, not field goals, but like kickoffs, which they didn't kick off that much, but still kick returns and punt returns. They just constantly had terrible field position because, look, you we have, have all this stuff about we're going to play our starters on special teams, right? Okay, that's great. Every, all, every coach says that. You have to play some of your twos and threes on special teams. Otherwise, your guys are going to be dead. And Vanderbilt's twos are not SEC caliber athletes in many cases. And I think that got exposed on special teams. So I think as they get a little more, little more athleticism into the program, um, 
they could have a little better field position here. I do kind of like the idea of Mike Wright being the quarterback because I don't think they can pass protect enough, and I don't think they have anybody at, at receiver who scares you that much to justify playing Ken Seals and throwing the ball around. I do think you could show tangible progress in terms of the win-loss record if you just let Mike Wright run around a whole bunch, and maybe you get some turnovers games, and, and there's some outside chance that that you're a little better than I think, and you win four, right? But I, I don't want the under two and a half. I, if I'm going to bet under on Vanderbilt, I'm going to go to the conference only win totals and, and take the under under half at plus money. Three and one, cashing it early. Mm-hmm. It's, it's starting in week zero, and uh, and and we're we're going to take care of all this disrespect, and we're gonna we're gonna address it before the end of September. I love it. All right, uh, before we get out of here, we wanted to address one of the bigger stories that broke overnight as Oklahoma wide receivers coach Kale Gundy resigned after it was revealed that he used inappropriate language in a film study with several Sooners players. Um, this was a story that uh, it, it drew a lot of some, some wrinkled brows uh, across college football. He is an Oklahoma alum. He has been there for 23 years. He has been through, obviously, several coaching changes. He is huge to the recruiting arm and the recruiting efforts, of which Oklahoma has been able to have some success even after the exit of Lincoln Riley to USC. Uh, the details, as written by Gundy in his statement, I noticed a player was distracted and picked up his iPad and read aloud the words that were written on the screen. The words displayed had nothing to do with football. On part- One particular word that I should never under any circumstance have uttered was displayed on the screen. In that moment, I did not realize what I was reading, and as soon as I did, I was horrified. I want to be clear. I, I want to be very clear. The words I read aloud from the screen were not my words. What I said was not malicious. It wasn't even intentional. Still, I'm mature enough to know the word I said was shameful and hurtful, no matter my intentions. The unfortunate reality is that someone in my position can cause harm even without meaning to do so. In that circumstance, a man of character accepts accountability. I take responsibility for my mistake. I apologize. So the what thoughts? I mean, Danny, do you want to lead this? I'm, I'm sure, sure. this was like at the top of the radio show. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. And Dusty and my partner on the radio, Dusty Dvorak, you know, played at Oklahoma. He lives in Norman. He's very close to the situation. I hate this. I absolutely despise this story uh, because it, no one wins. You know, no one is a winner here. Oklahoma doesn't look, you know, Brent Venables doesn't look good for stepping up and taking action. Um, we have a, somebody whose reputation ha- by all accounts has been a great coach, a great mentor, somebody who's poured his heart and soul into the university there is now being completely ruined. His, his life is being turned upside down because of one mistake. And I know there's a lot of speculation, people saying, well, there's got to be something more I'm telling you, Dusty swears up and down. There are no hidden skeletons. There is no other issue. This was a coach who read something off an iPad, a rap lyric that was on a player's iPad in a meeting, grabs it, reads it. Now, all that being said, I, how can you, how can you even go there if you're Gundy in this situation? Like I teach my daughters this, we've seen other stories that are similar of what you can lose, what's at stake. Even if you're repeating it, if you're rapping it, whatever it is, you just can't go there. I think I don't think it was a resignation. I think he was forced out and that was a, okay, we're going to let it appear like it's your resignation. I think this is a lot about an administration that got involved and said, this is a bad look for the entire university. This is bigger than football. We need to make sure this doesn't you know, harm our reputation. Um, I'm The one thing I'm disappointed by is I think a suspension would have been warranted. Firing to me seems really a steep price to pay for a mistake like this especially when you consider the players that are coming out backing him in particular, Joe Mixon, who Gundy spoke up for and went to bat for when Mixon had some really ugly stuff going on. He stood by him and, you know, I think it's just really unfortunate. I hate it. And, you know, the world's going to move on in two days, one day. And we've got a guy whose life has been upturned, you know, turned upside down. I hope he gets another opportunity, but, for now, I'm sure it feels like just absolute devastation. Do you guys buy this story? Yes. I do. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Why? I, I, I don't think that this is the sole reason. I really don't. I have a hard time. Because we saw this at TCU. We saw this at Utah. 
We saw this at Iowa. We saw this at a couple other places. And it did not lead to a forced firing, especially if you had a Ron Burgundy type moment where you're just reading it off the screen and you caught, oh my God, I can't believe I said that, right? Yeah, but I, this doesn't pass the smell test for me. I think Oklahoma is like, oh, I'm not I think Oklahoma is sneaky compared to the region, compared to your assumptions. I think that the Oklahoma University administration and campus is going to be a little bit more um, in touch and touchy. Be, and Oklahoma had that situation a few years ago with like frat. the frat guys, right? Yeah. So and I like think the that there's some team sensitivity. Was like the, yeah, the sense they're gonna be sensitive. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, I think the part of this too, like I can't doubt for like Venables when he was at Clemson, there was the Danny Perriman situation where they had something similar happen, and I'm wondering if how that went down at Clemson is influencing Venables' decision here. I I think I be, I mean, again, I have no idea what happened, but I am inclined to believe the story that as it's been shared, whether that's accurate, I don't know, but I I'm with you, Danny. If the story did go down the way that Kale Gundy described in his statement, I feel like we throw intent out with like the intent behind what happened. If there was no malice behind it, I think losing your job is a bit extreme. Like if it truly was just an accident, he's reading something out loud and then it's like, Whoop didn't mean to say that i don't think somebody should be fired for that i think there should be somewhat more misunderstanding but i also think that pr firestorms like we we've seen how this stuff can play out for a while and maybe they just the school the administrators do not want to deal with it in light of what happened with the frat a few years ago and then brent venables in light with what was happening at clemson a few years ago maybe it was just no let's just nip it in the bud and move on alan kenny uh blatant homerism on twitter also mentioned that you know there is the Okay, well, if a complaint was raised to administration, the administration is going to conduct an investigation. And if this thing just draws out and there's a big investigation into it, does that end up hurting Kale Gundy personally and professionally in ways that are more damaging than just trying to get ahead of this? I mean, is like does Kale Gundy end up as an offensive analyst at Oklahoma State here in just a little bit? I think that is more likely because that he didn't have to go through this big university investigation type situation. A lot of players have spoken up and, and like you said, Danny, definitely a nobody wins type scenario here, but I, I don't think that there's, I, I don't think that we're going to have like an NCAA violation story come out about it. Right. Like, I don't, I don't think that there's something else here, but that I understand why, but I understand why you're looking at it and you're like, ah, I don't know. I mean, we've only heard, his, we've only heard his side so far. We've not heard, we've not heard from the player. Like, like he is, has every incentive in the world to paint himself in this light. Oklahoma also has every incentive in the world to sort of, if there was something more, which again, I don't know, or even really think there is. I just think this story sounds fishy. Like they have every incentive in the world to like, let's just move on from this. The guy's gone. I, I, I would just like to hear more. I'm not saying there is more. I'm just so curious. Yeah. Yeah. It's my understanding that the player that was involved, the player that wrote it on the iPad, wanted him to stay. That's that's according to the Oklahoma sources that I have. <laughs> you know, that's that's my understanding. Um, you know, there was a a, lo a overwhelming amount of players wanted him to stay, but for however many did not like it, that was enough. You know, and I think that is one of those votes where, when you have to have a a feel of your locker room. If it's not a hundred percent, I think this is one of those issues move. where you have to say, I can't have a, I can't have this left. I can't have this hanging over our team as something that could divide us. It's like college football playoff before the ESPN deal is up. It's gotta be 11. Oh, baby. If the Alliance right. gets out here as yeah. three, then you're, you're not going to be able to do it. All right. Let's uh, the, the real quick, the coaches poll has, uh, has been released. We got it on the screen. Snazzy little graphic right here. Ooh. Um, Early thought I mentioned that Georgia. I love the fact if you are into the Georgia over, as many of us are, that they are going to be able to take care of business and sort of operate outside of that one two debate that will be at the center of college football. Any thoughts right off the bat looking at the top 25 as voted on by the 65 or 66 coaches um, in the coaches poll? I my favorite thing about preseason polls is just trying to figure out where everybody's mind is at and everybody wants to hype up USC, Miami, and Texas. And I, we feel like people who are filling out their ballots are clearly like, all right, these are my top 10 to 14 teams. 
now is the safe spot to put Texas. Now is the safe time to put USC because there they are at 15, 17, and 18. So that is the safe spot in the mind of the voters where it's like, I can have them in there and maybe I look smart if they win, but if they lose, I won't look too stupid afterwards. Did you see Texas got a vote for number one? Yes. No. <laughs> yes. It's hard because I said there were 65 first place votes when I was referencing earlier. Right. You didn't see it like snuck that. all the I way down there. The one down there. <laughs> Is That's Sark ridiculous. a voter? Yes. No, oh, no, then Sark would have been first I place. Oh, no, no. Sark is not. I'm sorry. Oh, is it okay. right? I don't I think you could do a first place vote for your own team, can you? Jimbo. Jimbo put him at first. Oh, yes. <laughs> Jimbo's trolling put me Longhorns <laughs> first. What? Stan Drayton, uh, the Temple head coach, put Texas first. Do we know that we're back? Not, oh, okay. I don't know. I was going to say, the, the coaches poll is usually pretty good about not letting people find out. The last one of the season, they let you do. They yeah, reveal. They reveal. Who got what, Except but, for Troy um, Calhoun. Troy Calhoun owns it at Air Force. He's like, I'll oh, he used to do a thing where every Monday he would like tell his vote. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I wish more coaches would do that. Who can do? Calhoun is the worst thing that happens. Calhoun's yeah. already owned it. No, no, no. He's no, saying he that Troy one. Calhoun used to release his ballot every week because yeah. who cares? What's right. going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They're going to strip you of your right to vote in the coaches poll. Okay, fine. I'll go back to my job. <laughs> uh, for more on the coaches poll, check it out over at CBSSports.com, including a piece from Barrett Salee on teams that are overrated and underrated. You can follow him on Twitter at Bud Elliott 3 You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow him at Tom Fernell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. We will be back on Wednesday with the SEC West. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.